I welcome you all to the lecture 7 of the course title Psychology of Emotion Theory and Applications. Uh, so, it is overall lecture 7 and it is the second lecture of the module 3. So, the module 3 is about understanding the physiological impact of emotion or what physiological changes happens, as happens at around the whenever we experience emotions. So, in the last lecture uh, we have discussed emotion how it impacts your the body and today's lecture will be talking about how emotion has you know, you know is associated with physiological changes in the brain itself. So, before we uh, talk about today's lecture let me give you a brief recap of the last lecture where we talked about how emotion is associated with uh, various physiological changes in the body. So, in that context we have discussed there are you know the body uh, all the emotions are you know kind of involve our body you know certain physiological changes happens uh, whenever we experience some uh, emotions particularly the intense emotions. So, some changes physiological changes happens in the body uh, and we all might have experienced that whenever we experience anger or fear there, there will be some changes in the body which can be very much visibly visible if it is a very strong emotion. So, fear may be associated with the you know shaking of the body uh, you know increase of heart rate and, and so on. So, a lot of these physiological changes are very apparent. Uh, so, uh, in that context we have discussed primarily physiological changes are associated with autonomic nervous system and uh, hormones. So, autonomic nervous system we have already discussed is about uh, that part of nervous system which controls all the automatic functions of the body. So, it kind of you know conveys signals from the brain to the different organs or internal glands of the body such as digestion, heartbeat and all kinds of things, breathing patterns and so on. These are all controlled by autonomic nervous system. They do not need our conscious intervention, automatically they happen. And in that context, we have discussed sympathetic part of autonomic nervous system is primarily responsible for uh, most of the emotions, you know, whatever, whenever we experience some emotions, particularly the intense emotions, sympathetic nervous system activates the body, you know, uh, or physiological changes happen. So, I know it gives more energy to the body to deal with the situation. Uh, so, all these things we have discussed uh, and the second aspect is uh, basically you know uh, we talked about different hormones uh, that are present in the body where you know, uh, you know the release of a lot of hormones are associated with experience of the emotions. So, in that context we have discussed adrenaline, cortisol, dopamine, serotonin, estrogen and testosterone. So, uh, there are other hormones, but these are some of the major hormones that we have discussed. So, adrenaline and cortisol are mostly related to the uh, you know, experience of the stress, anxiety and also particularly the distress. So, all kinds of uh, you know, distress or stress related uh, emotions uh, kind of lead to the release of stress hormones, uh, particularly adrenaline and cortisol. So, adrenaline and cortisol are mostly related to the uh, stress system, uh, stress whenever we experience stressful uh, experiences uh, or emotions which are very distressing, they generally lead to the release of adrenaline and cortisol. Both of these hormones are basically related to um, you know uh, kind of giving uh, you know preparing the body to fight with the situation or kind of uh, deal with the situation by giving extra energy and you know, increasing heart rate and so on. Uh, that there are certain differences in the pathways how adrenaline is released and how cortisol is released. So, there are differences we have discussed in the last class. Dopamine and serotonin are basically also called as happy hormones, primarily they are all in the you know uh, positive mood and so on. Uh, so, today's lecture also will be discussed in little bit more detail about dopamine and serotonin. Estrogen and testosterone are also related to the uh, you know changes in the mood, particularly estrogen uh, it is uh, the primarily found among females and the changes or fluctuations in the levels of estrogen can lead to you know uh, shifts in the mood and so on. Uh, testosterone has also been found uh, found to be associated with aggressions and anger apart from uh, its impact on the mood and so on. So, these are some of the things that we have discussed in the last class. So, today we will be talking about uh, primarily uh, physiological changes in the brain or changes in the brain associated with the emotional experiences. So, the key concept that we will be talking in today's lecture are brain lateralization, triune mo brain model, uh, we will also talking about the role of amygdala an organ in the in the brain and uh, its role in the emotions and we will be talking about some neurotransmitters, uh, those are 
uh, you know hormones which are you know primarily associated with certain you know changes in the brain itself like dopamine serotonin and endorphins so we'll be seeing uh, looking at their roles in the you know emotional experiences so let's start today's lecture the concept of lateralization uh, is 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 kind of one of the most popular concepts in the neuroscience uh, that basically uh, says the brain is divided into two halves so if you have if you if you have seen anatomy of the brain or any picture of the brain you will you might have seen there are two distinctive parts in the brain left brain and the right brain so this division of brain itself is basically the concept associated with lateralization basically talks about this division so there are two division of lever kind of concept two parts of the brain with some distinctive functions associated with them so brain is divided into two halves with distinct functions so that typically is called the concept of lateralization so there are uh, two parts of the brain right half of the brain is primarily responsible uh, for the right brain is primarily responsible for emotions while the left brain is primarily responsible for language and logical thinking process okay. so it's more like one part is dominant for certain task another part is dominant for some other type of task so that is the concept of lateralization now researcher kind of they try to study this or how they came to know about this kind of functions so different strategies were involved some of the researcher basically they uh, looked at these functions of each half by temporarily paralyzing one side uh, by testing with the functions of the other part so one side was temporarily disabled by using certain you know chemicals and then typically you see which what kind of functions are dominant in the other part because the only that part is active the other part is kind of uh, non functional at that time so when the left half is paralyzed a picture may elicit emotional experiences so that means only right half is doing the function so the functions of other half could be very clearly seen through this kind of uh, experiments while when the right half is paralyzed it may lead to logical thoughts and meaning related to image this is how some of the experiments were done and these functions were discovered now people with a dominant left half so some people may be more dominantly some part of some uh, side of the brain could be dominant for some other people other part could be dominant so depending on that certain functionalities or dominance of certain functions could be visible in human human behavior so people with dominant left half are often described as analytical people people who are very analytical lot of logical thinking critical thinking so typically their left half of the brain is more active while the people with the dominant right half are often seen as more imaginative creative and emotional creativity uh, and um, emotional aspects become much more dominant for people whether when their right half of the brain is more dominant means it is more functional for whatever reason however now this lateralization concept that you know uh, is not a kind of very definitive only that if right half only does this and it cannot do any other thing so that it is not that kind of definitive division of lever but it is more of a dominance of certain functions rather than only exclusive functions so this means that individuals dominated by uh, left half are not without emotion that doesn't mean the people who are very logical and analytical they don't have emotions so the right half is also kind of functional only thing is that what aspects are more dominant and those dominated by the right half are not without the ability to reason and logically so people who are very emotional creativity doesn't mean they don't have the logical thinking and other kind of thing so it is more like dominance of function rather than exclusive functions so additionally many factors beside lateral dominance can influence person characteristics so what kind of characteristics what kind of qualities and uh, mental functions one can do is not just determined by lateralization there can be so many other factors that can determine why what are the um, the characteristics of a person uh so this is one of the aspects which could explain uh the differential functions among uh, people or dominance of functions among human beings so this is one of the picture that is taken uh, from one of the uh, research paper so it very clearly so the the lateralization concept can be very clearly visible so this is the left part of so you can see very clearly a fissure that divides the left one 
and the right part of the brain. So, it is very clearly there are two sections of the brain. So, this is the left and this is the right. So, left brain has uh, different function like analytical thought, logical thought, language, more like analyzing, criticizing, discussing, explaining, you know those kind of functions are associated with like mostly language and thoughts and thinking. Right half is about holistic thought, intuitions, creativity, art, music, drawing, gestures, all these kinds of uh, more creative and emotional aspects are uh, busy, uh, more controlled by the right half of the brain. So, this is the concept of uh, in brief about lateralization. So, that is also one of the aspects where we can explain emotion from the brain anatomy itself. So, sometimes people may be more emotional. One of the reason is that the right part of the brain is taking the dominance and that may make some people more emotional. So, experience of emotion may be associated with see, this concept of lateralization. Another one of the very uh, initial concept that was given is also called as triune brain model. So, this also explain you know how human brain has evolved for emotional functions. So, Maclean in 1952 he proposed this triune model of brain model uh, which is one of the earliest model uh, that describes brain and emotions, how brain is associated with emotions. Uh, he divided human brain into three segments. So, according to him the evolution as evolution happened different segments appeared one above the other uh, in the human brain. So, the one is called first one is called reptilian part of the brain uh, that is responsible for basic sensory survival and reflex actions. So, all the reflexive functions sensory survival related functions are done by this part of the brain called reptilian part of the brain. So, we will show you the picture uh, in the next slide. So, this is the most basic function which is probably shared with all the other animals also that instinctive functions that are required for survival. No? So, whenever some danger happens automatically you try to run away or something like that. So, instinctively you run away you do not have to think much. So, those kind of basic survival related reflex functions are controlled by reptilian part of the brain. Uh, then the next part that evolved above the reptilian brain is called mammalian brain uh, which is in charge of emotional experiences. So, it is called limbic brain also it is said as limbic brain. So, the mammalian part of the brain is uh, responsible for all the emotional experiences that happen. So, some of the animals who can experience some um, emotions, basic emotions. Uh, so, it is it, it, it can be seen in the mammals uh, including human beings. So, so that part of the brain kind of evolved to exp, you know to kind of you know um, help us to experience emotional uh, diverse emotional experiences. The last one that evolved the outer layer of the brain is called neocortex. Uh, this is the part most recently evolved all these convolutions that we see whenever you open the skull, the outer layer of the brain uh, that is called as uh, neocortex. So, it is neo means new cortex that was developed. So, it kind of uh, deals with all the complex thinking process and reasoning in human beings. So, one of the reason human beings get, could think so elaborately and complex things that can be you know uh, uh, we can process through human brain is primarily responsible part is neocortex because of the evolution of neocortex uh, which is not that evolved in animals. So, the thinking process evolved with the neocortex development of neocortex. So, this three part that is why it is called triune model. So, there are three layers of brain responsible for different functions evolved with the evolution of uh, different species. <coughs> So, according to Maclean, uh, the brain evolved during the course of uh, vertebrate evolution into three layered organs. So, this is a kind of evolutionary process with each layer retaining some distinctiveness of its multiple evolutionary origins despite being intimately interconnected. So, all these layers are inter interconnected, but they have distinctive functions as well. The consequence of each layer can be seen in human behavior, particularly the link between cognition and emotions. So, all these different layers are kind of interconnected, they kind of interact with each other to kind of determine all kinds of complex human behavior. So, this is one of the first you know figure you know which was uh, given for uh, now uh, this one triune brain model. So, 
this is the, the the innermost part is the reptilian part of brain responsible for all the instinctive intuitive functions uh, survival related functions it is kind of shared with all the animals limbic system then evolved above it which is mostly related to this is also called as a mammalian part of the brain responsible for all emotions neocortex the outer layer gray matter evolved uh, and with the evolution of this one uh, complex thinking process evolved and it is primarily uh, you know, seen in human beings. So, the reptilian brain uh, that we have uh, seen is, is the first part of the brain that evolved according to this model the oldest layer which is referred as reptilian brain. Uh, it consists of brain stem as an organ including the medulla these are the different organs that are there in that particular part of the brain. So, the different organs are there the name these are the name of the organ okay? medulla, pons, cerebellum, midbrain and so on the, the, these are the different organs that are there in the reptilian part of the brain and they kind of help to survive and carry out all the instinctive functions required which are prevalent in the reptiles you know. So, it kind of evolved from the reptile reptilians whatever reptiles we see they also have this part of the brain and it evolved and still remains with us. So, this layer of the brain is not very adaptable this is not much changing no with the learning it may not change much this is very it does all the vital functions. So, it is not very adaptable it is much more rigid in its functionalities uh, it is not adaptable to learning from experience it tends to repeat it is more repetitive instinctual behavior in a rigid manner it does. So, this part of the brain is not much changing it is only controlling the vital functions. In human this part of the brain governs vital functions uh, such as breathing, heart rate, balance and all these things which are necessary for survival. So, in humans we still have that reptilian part of brain and it does all these important functions. Then comes mammalian brain or limbic part of the brain uh, this is mostly responsible for emotions uh, it kind of stay it evolve above the reptilian brain. So, this part is above the reptilian brain uh, is primarily composed of group of brain structure known as limbic system. So, mammalian brain has different organs which are connected to each other and they are called collectively called as a limbic system. This limbic system was first identified in 1800s uh, you know uh, 1800s, but it became uh, you know much more popular because of this neuroanatomist Papez because of his research which he published in 1973. So, he first identified this uh, limbic system and it is also called as Papez circuit you know because he was the first person who kind of you know. Uh, popularized or kind of made it more mainstream by his research uh, that emotional functions of the brain which associated with the limbic system became much more evident because of his research. So, it is also called as Pape's circuit uh, is another term that is used to describe limbic system. Uh, it includes organs like amygdala, hippocampus and many other kinds of you uh, know cingulate gyrus, hypothalamus, ventral stratum etcetera. So, these are all collectively called as limbic system. So, we will look into that uh, uh, little bit more. So, this this all these organs are kind of does different functions including the emotional aspects of uh, the brain. So, limbic system um, the major functions of the limbic system all these organs which are in the circuit they plays major functions in terms of experience of emotions in the in the brain. So, we can see the impact of limbic system in our conscious experience in the heightened valence positive and negative feelings and also the perceived significance of specific thoughts and images. So, whenever we experience a lot of emotion this limbic system become much more you know activated because of whenever we experience emotions. So, this part of the brain is shared with mammals that is why it is also called mammalian part of the brain all the other mammals and uh, we can readily observe prototypical mammalian emotional response in our pet like cats and dogs they also have you know this limbic system. Then comes uh, the neocortex, uh, neocortex is the newest development in the brain and typically in the human brain 
it's also in the primate brain it is also kind of evolved it is characterized by convoluted covering of the cerebr uh, cerebral hemisphere so whatever the outer layer that we see convoluted structure gray matter that we see uh, that is called as a neocortex compared to other mammals the neocortex has significantly expanded in non human primates and humans so it is primarily seen in no, you know primates and humans okay so and more specifically humans so that led to the development of complex thinking processes in humans this neocortex is responsible for our sophisticated cognitive linguistic motor sensory and social abilities so all these complex abilities that have evolved in human beings it is neocortex that is responsible for it it allows us to be uh, you know adaptable and creative uh, in response to constantly changing environment so this part is more adaptable with the learning it changes it can uh, all the functionings can be, can evolve can change with the new learning experiences so this is much more flexible and um, it help us to adapt to different circumstances so, you know, so that adaptability is one of the characteristics of neocortex this neocortex also plays a very uh, critical role in regulating emotions because a lot of human emotions if you look at it uh, emotions could generate but then it is our thinking process that also influences our emotions so there is a very strong connection between emotions and thought processes uh, some of these functions we will be looking later in some of the lectures so neocortex also you know kind of interact with the emotional experiences and it has important roles to play particularly in the regulation of emotions uh, so in, in limbic system may be responsible for emotional experience but this neocortex is also kind of interacting with it in terms of regulating in terms of modulating the experiences of emotion and it enables us to have more nuanced emotional experiences so all the complex emotional experiences that human beings experiences one of the reason is this uh, this neocortex it's it's ability it's because of its ability of complex thinking process that it can give shape um, and exper and ca express itself in all kinds of complex uh, you know emotional experience nuanced emotional experiences so neocortex assessment of situation is essential for socializing and controlling the expression of emotions so it is the neocortex that gives an assessment and interpretation of the situation uh which um, which kinds of you know determines a lot of emotional experiences how do you interpret based on that the colors of emotions comes into the picture we have discussed some of these things in the theories of emotions that we have discussed in some of the initial lectures now this prion model is not like you know uh, it has also many limitations a lot of newer research has challenged some of these ideas of uh, prion brain model proposed by maclin it indicates that indi which indicates the sensory emotional and higher cognitive process are not solely confined to individual regions so a lot of this newer research has show that the, the lot of these functions that are specifically shown only you know uh, that uh, this part of the brain does only this function so those kind of evidences are not very much you know they are in light of today's uh, research that most of the brain kinds of works in an integrated fashion so these are not solely confined to individual regions but rather involve activation across all the regions so lot most of this function requires input from all the different parts of the brain rather than exclusively from some part of the brain so in that context trion model is not kind of is challenged of its very you know specific region wise functionalities uh, despite this obviously this model has given a uh, lot of insights in terms of some dominant functions of different parts of the brain and it helps us to identify different system particularly the uh, uh, the different uh, like limbic system uh, which is responsible for emotions and so on uh, which can play very critical and dominant role in emotions so at least it identify different structures uh, that are still you know play very critical role in emotional processes so this trion brain theory can still be useful framework for understanding the distinct layer of mammalian brain obviously you know this brain has all these layers there is no doubt about it and they have some of the dominant functions that are you know discussed in the trion model obviously brain uh, functions more in an integrated fashion but this framework still useful in terms of identifying different structures for uh, and and their functions cortical and subcortical regions of the brain work in a coordinated manner to allow us to experience express 
and regulate our emotion in appropriate way. So, that is the kind of integrated uh, idea that brain functions in by integrating by taking inputs from diverse brain regions in an integrative fashion it works. Dysfunction in any of this region can lead to a range of emotional disorders such as depression, anxiety, post traumatic stress disorders. Now, the most important part or organ in the brain uh, which kind of research has shown the most significant part in the context of emotional experience is amygdala. So, it is an it is a part of limbic system, uh, it is an organ that is in that circuit, circuit of limbic system and uh, primarily lot of research has gone into this particular organ and its role in emotions, particularly fear as an emotion. So, we will see some of the research finding here. So, the amygdala uh, especially the, in the early investigation of emotional neuroscience, uh, the amygdala emerges as a prominent area uh, of interest within the brain's temporal lobe. So, within the temporal lobe or the part of the brain, uh, the amygdala that is there, we will see the, uh, the positioning of amygdala and so on. So, amygdala has received lot of attention because of certain research findings or some of the accidental findings. Amygdala gets its name from the Greek word for almond because of its shape, it is almond shaped, has a roughly almond like shape with a bilateral structure present in each hemisphere. So, amygdala it is a bilateral means each hemisphere has one one amygdala. So, both the hemisphere has no separate amygdala. So, that is why it is bilateral. So, two amygdalas are present one in each of the hemisphere. So, it receives input from various senses including visions, hearing, pain, enab pain enabling it to link uh, various stimuli with outcomes that follow. So, it, it also receives lot of input from sense organs and it kind of uh, influence the outcome that follow. So, additionally it also sends information to the pons and other regions controlling the reflex function. So, it is kind of mediates lot of functions. So, reflex functions also it kind of uh, mediates information as well as to the hippocampus, prefrontal cortex. So, it is kind of connected with the different kinds of organs which does different functions. So, in, in that context it plays very vital role. So, all these connections allows the amygdala to play a very crucial part in the mediation and control of major affective behaviors such as friendship, love, affection, mood expression and most importantly fear, rage and aggression. In all this it plays role. So, in that context it is very important structure in human brain. So, you can see uh, some of the important major, uh, major organs in the limbic system. So, amygdala is somewhere here. So, if you see it is kind of circuit where now different other organs are connected. So, somewhere here it is hippocampus which does uh, many functions and one of the major function that it does is the formation of memory. It uh, does a lot of functions. So, we will see how amygdala and hippocampus kind of uh, know, also are kind of connected in uh, and in terms of helps in the formation of memory associated with emotions. So, hippocampus then uh, this one is thalamus, here it is hypothalamus. So, these are some of the fun important organs which are uh, responsible or who responsible for emotional experiences and they are all in the circuit of limbic system. So, <coughs> lots of functions of amygdala actually emerged or it become evident because of certain study of brain damage observation from cases with amygdala. So, so, in the cases where the amygdala got damaged because of certain accidents and when, when an organ or part of the brain gets damaged, its, its functionality become much more evident because now that organ is not there. So, whatever is visible which was not there earlier can be attributed to that particular structure. So, like many other structure, amygdala initially caught the attention of researcher due to the behaviors exhibited by individuals who had suffered damage to it. So, because of certain reason amygdala got damaged. So, a lot of different behavior emerged and that led to the discovery of the functions of amygdala. So, some of this case study we will see now. 
So, in 1930s two uh, researchers studying monkeys, they discovered Kluver and Bussy syndrome. So, this, this is the name of these two scientists, one was Kluver and another was Bussy. So, they discovered this, so that is what is called as Kluver Bussy syndrome KBS. Uh, they first noticed that a set of emotional change that occur when both anterior temporal lobes including amygdala are removed. So, in the monkeys they first uh, discovered the impact of amygdala when this both the amygdalas were removed uh, from the brain. So, they observed certain behavioral uh, functions or changes in the behavior of monkeys that led to some of the ideas of the functions of the amygdala. So, this animal uh, what happened after the removal of the amygdala from the brain this function uh, this animals fail to recognize the emotional significance of the objects. So, we all know that certain objects are dangerous. So, we become careful when we touch those kind of objects. So, this sense also is kind of you know uh, that sense of fear is you no know, that amygdala was responsible for that. When amygdala was removed uh, this significance of the object that you know associated with certain emotions they that was not visible in the behavior. So, this animal failed to recognize the emotional significance of the objects. For example, they approaching snakes picking up you know lit matches and uh, putting faces in uh, faces in their mouths. So, disgusting objects they could they could put it. So, but they were, there was they, they could not distinguish uh, the emotional significance of some objects. So, snakes generally they would kind of be afraid of snakes, but they in that when amygdala was removed they are no longer afraid of snakes. Uh, they could also pick lit matches, matches uh, so which was dangerous for them earlier generally a monkey would not do that, but when amygdala was removed they could do the, those kind of functions. So, lot of this emotional aspects associated with objects they were no longer there because when amygdala was removed. So, it was very clear somehow that emotional aspects of amygdala functioning of amygdala became much more evident. Monkeys with damaged amygdala uh, also fearlessly approach ag aggressive monkeys and unfamiliar humans often resulting in injury. So, they were not at all making any discrimination based on what is dangerous, what is not dangerous. So, that comes from the experience of or the emotion of fear and those kind of emotions if it is there you judge everything based on what is more dangerous, what is less dangerous. Now, this kind of judgment was not there in those monkeys where this uh, amygdala was removed for some reasons. So, it clearly showed the role of amygdala in terms of emo emotional experiences particularly fear. Similar patterns were also observed in some other animals like normal rats and mice would stop what they were doing when they detect a scent of a cat. Generally, a mice or rat generally stops and becomes much more alert when they detect a cat somewhere in their environment. However, when tranquilizer reduces amygdala activity, rats become indifferent to the smell of cats. So, that they were no longer afraid of cats because cat is a predator you know it can it will catch immediately and kind of uh, you know. So, one of the most dangerous object for a rat. So, normal rat would kind of become alert and try to stop doing everything else and run away and those kind of thing behavior was there, but when amygdala was removed those behaviors were not no longer away visible in the rats when the tranquilizer reduced the activity of the amygdala. Some rats and mice will even fearlessly approach a cat after their amygdala has been destroyed. So, the concept of fear was kind of removed because of the removal of the amygdala. Humans with damaged amygdala is very limited cases because it is not ethically possible to do lot of these experiments especially in today's world. Uh, so, the damage cases were very little and uh, the, it was not like you know you cannot directly damage it and see the impact of it which is ethically not possible. So, it's a very limited uh, case studies are available. Uh, it's very rare. Uh, some of the but stroke patient often have damaged amygdala and surrounding areas. Some cases of patient who has the history of stroke, uh, which led to the damage of amygdala and associated areas, uh, are available. Uh, so some of the findings are visible from those kind of 
patients. Urbach with disease is, is one of the name of the disease. It is a condition that happens where the calcium gets accumulated in the amygdala and subsequently it damages it often without much damage generally other surrounding area remains fine, but amygdala gets damaged because particularly you know in, in this particular disease. So, some of the patients with this kind of disease also uh, were became a case study for amygdala functions. So, our understanding of the human amygdala is largely based on small number of this kind of patients. So, individuals with amygdala damage exhibit symptoms very similar to those monkeys that were you know we have you know, done uh, monkeys where amygdala was removed in Kluber Bussy syndrome, uh, where they kind of no longer afraid of things that they used to afraid, they used to become afraid. So, they put inedible or disgusting substances in their mouths, this is in case of humans and will approach strangers randomly when seeking help rather than selecting someone who appears friendly or trustworthy. So, again here also human beings where there was a damage of amygdala, they could they are also the fear related uh, behaviors were no longer visible much. So, the earlier lot of objects based on their friendliness or trustworthiness people generally you know, judge a lot of things and then they approach people and behave accordingly. Uh, with the damage of amygdala those kind of appraisal those kind of interpretations those kind of things who are no longer there. So, people would do things which are dangerous probably for the for uh, so, without that that's judgment of danger was not there in their whole cognition. So, people with amygdala damage rate all faces as almost equally friendly or trustworthy when asked to assess them. So, that was also another thing in the experiments where they are asked to judge faces where of uh, faces of different emotions were shown to them. Uh, patients with amygdala damage, you know, they rated almost all faces equally friendly or trustworthy, which a normal person will never do it. So, certain faces are looks like more dangerous, so yeah, having certain anger emotions. So, they will not be rated equally in terms of uh, friendliness or trustworthiness, but uh, that kind of judgment was not there in the patients with amygdala damage. So, so, generally this lot of this observation clearly indicated the role of amygdala in emotions and mostly it was associated with fear became much more evident. Fear was the most strong emotion that was important emotion that was associated with all these findings. So, we will see more specifically with the context of fear as an emotion and how it is connected to the amygdala. So, individuals with the damage to their amygdala display notable characteristics of being fearless towards anything. So, this was kind of evident in all this experiment that was done. Earlier whatever object was the, the person was person or the animals used to be afraid of certain objects. Now, after uh, damage to the amygdala or removal of amygdala in animals, uh, they were no longer fearful towards those objects. Earlier they were very fearful, now they are no longer fearful that was very evident. So, this observation prompted researchers to investigate whether amygdala plays very crucial role in fear associated behaviors. At least those findings indicate that amygdala is strongly connected to the experience of the fear. When rats were subjected to amygdala damage, they not only failed to acquire new stimuli related to danger, but also lost previously learned fear replaces. So, it was uh, the research showed that they not only were not fearful in the present context they even forgot all the past learned fear responses. So, that was also lost. Although one study suggested that right amygdala damage resulted in greater deficit than left amygdala damage, some study shows the differences could be uh, more notable in case when uh, right part of the right hemisphere amygdala was removed as compared to the left, but the different, uh, but it was much more profound when both the amygdala were damaged. So, all these findings at least you know indicate that amygdala activation is responsible for experience of the fear, at least lot of these evidences indicates. So, some theories are more stronger versions and some theories are uh, little less in terms of how they believe about the functions of amygdala in response to fear. Strongest such hypothesis or strongest theory tells, tells that fear is synonymous with amygdala almost it's, it could be one of the strongest prediction uh, and any individual or 
creates are lacking an amygdala is incapable of feeling of fear. So, it is the strongest version that fear means amygdala. So, without amygdala no fear. Less extreme interpretation is the amygdala activity may be crucial for perceiving threatening situations. So, it is not like all the fears are associated with amygdala, but it is important for perceiving threatening situations. So, it is very important to judge a situation as threatening or not amygdala is responsible exhibiting fear associated behaviors, but it may not be necessarily be required for experiencing of fear. So, certain aspects of fear may be associated with amygdala as compared to no fear without amygdala. So, research generally you will see the evidences of evidence shows more evidence towards the less extreme interpretation. So, this emphasizes the constraints of conducting research in laboratory and so this kind of research are very difficult to conduct. Uh, especially you cannot do most of these experiments with the human beings because of ethical issues you cannot really damage some organ and look what is its impact. Even in animals there are ethical issues you cannot just do an uh, experiment on animals. Uh, if it harms it uh, you know there are ethical and the issues and uh, the researcher has to take care of lot of ethical issues. Uh, and so, lot of constraints are there for doing this kind of research, especially the ethical issues. Uh, and uh, with animals, they cannot communicate also what is happening with them. Uh, so, you cannot kind of understand and uh, human beings very less cases are there, so, but some whatever cases are there you know, more deeper understanding came from those human studies only. So, in context of human fear, we will see more in the context of human, how amygdala was associated with fear what role does amygdala play in the experience of fear. So, that is the those two hypotheses that was proposed, uh, we will see evidences associated with this whether the you know, extreme case was uh, evidences are available or less extreme cases or hypothesis was kind of you know uh, evidences are associated with those uh, less extreme hypothesis or not. So, if the amygdala is damaged, which aspect of the fear are affected? So, these are some of the things, these are the questions that were uh, addressed by a lot of researcher. So, while it is uncommon to come across patients with selective amygdala damage, few cases as we have seen uh, where studies were done. In some individual with amygdala damage, there is a reduction in the magnitude of distress related. So, some studies show there is a reduction in the magnitude of distress related startling facilitation as observed in the study with rats. Uh, rats ke case may be jaysa dekha, th that was uh, evident similar sy symptoms or uh, reactions were also evident in human beings. Additionally, uh, MRI uh, magnetic resonance imaging studies also sh showed that amygdala displays more activity, more heightened activity during fear conditioning and when individuals encounter cues of danger. So, whenever they experience fear or some cues related to danger, uh, generally at that uh, time amygdala became more activated. So, that was visible in MRI imaging studies. So, that also shows this is uh, when some organs or some uh, part of the brain becomes more activated when certain functions are done. That means, those functions are associated with that part of the brain. Obviously, it is not so easy to make such conclusion a lot of other things we need to observe, but this is one of the implications of those kind of uh, imaging studies. So, numerous studies also found that individuals with amygdala damage have difficulty recognizing fearful facial expression. So, particularly this fearful face they could kind of re it was difficult to recognize what kind of emotions they are going through. So, if you see a fearful face generally we will understand it or we can say okay, there is fear evident in the face of that person. So, amygdala damage leads to the difficulty in recognizing of such fearful faces. So, that also shows that fear related things kind of you know affected. So, in one of the instance women with this uh, particular condition Urbach with disease with the disease uh, was able to draw representation of happy, sad, surprised, disgusted and angry faces. He, she could draw those happy face surprise face, disgusted face, angry face, but she could not draw a frightened face. This again shows the fear related things somehow was not able to process, she was not able to process it. 
fMRI studies, uh, magnetic resonance, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging studies also showed that amygdala exhibits greater activity when being fearful phases than neutral phases. When fearful phases were shown, amygdala became much more active as compared to when neutral phases were shown, even when they were presented subliminally means that was not very clearly consciously visible, but subliminally they were presented. Uh, consciously one person may not be uh, aware of what is presented, but very subliminally it was presented. Some studies indicate that the patient with amygdala damage report experiencing fear and other emotion relatively normally in day to day life. Some studies also show that they even with the damage of amygdala some, some people could experience emotions in the day to day lives. In a study that compared stroke patient with amygdala damage to those patients with other areas. So, some patients amygdala was damaged stroke patient and uh, so with some other patients who had damage of other areas weren't there. So, this participant rated a series of picture for pleasantness and unpleasantness and reported how aroused they felt. So, this was the experiment that was done. So, in both these cases of patients one case or one group where amygdala was damaged in another group some other area were damaged and they rated a series of pictures shown to them on the quality of pleasantness and unpleasantness. Uh, the research the result shows that individuals with amygdala damage rated the picture similarly for pleasantness or unpleasantness with other group of patients but they reported almost no arousal in response to unpleasant images. So, whenever they could see unpleasant image, uh, there, was, there was no physiological arousal which was normal in other kind of people. So, at least it indicates that a lot of evidences are there for amygdala um, that it is uh, uh, that is responsible for emotional experience particularly the fear related emotions. Uh, but may not be all facets of emotions may not be kind of associated with amygdala. So, kind of less extreme kind of uh, hypothesis where evidences are generally visible, uh, but no doubt most of the evidences shows that it has very strong role to play in the experience of fear. Now, experience of the fear there is another aspects associated with it is the memory. So, lot of fear is associated with the memory and emotional memory or emotions are associated with lot of memories also. So, amygdala can play a role in the formation of memory also. Let us see the evidences. Does amygdala play a role in creating emotional memories? If it plays role in emotions, then they should also play a role. Uh, they might, it might also play a role in formation of emotional memory as well. So, amygdala uh, does not appear to be essential for every type of memory. So, it is not responsible for all kinds of memory. So, there are different kinds of memory. Uh, we can have a memory for learning facts and figure. There can be memory for ep remembering episodes that happened in our life, episodic memory. So, different kinds of memories are there. Uh, we will not go into uh, too much of memory aspects now. For instance, a study on patient with amygdala damage found that they could comprehend that a conditioned fear stimuli meant a loud noise as approaching, but they did not show a physical response to it. They could kind of comprehend what is this all about that this is a, a response, uh, this is a conditioning response uh, which stimulates fear, but they did not actually show any fear. Mentally they understood this is associated, this is associated with fear, but they could not actually experience it. So, amygdala damage did not hinder their ability to learn facts, factually they could learn understand everything, but in terms of experiencing uh, their capacity was kind of hindered. So, Elizabeth Phelps all has also highlighted the amygdala's connection to the hippocampus. As we have seen in the diagram that hippocampus and amygdala is very connected to each other, positions also very nearby to each other and hippocampus as an structure in the brain. Uh, it does a lot of important functions in formation of episodic memories. So, to remember an episodes of your life, let us say, uh, is, is, is different from remembering effects. So, these are different types of memory, remembering an episode of your life and remembering some facts about something, these are two uh, different types of memory. 
So, for a episodic memory is more likely to involve emotions because we remember a lot of episodes in our life, especially if they become their emotions are associated with those uh, those episodes. So, let us say you may remember your last birthday because lot of happiness, lot of guests were there, relatives were there, you enjoyed, you had lot of happy memories about it. So, this is an episodic memory uh, which is lot of emotions also included in it. So, hippocampus uh, kind of uh, mediates those formation of episodic memory. Now, amygdala is connected to hippocampus. So, it can also kind of contribute to formation of episodic memory, especially the emotion part of it. So, amygdala activations related to experiencing strong emotion facilitates this consolidation of long term episodic memory. So, those episodes where emotions are involved, it is activation of amygdala that probably also you know, facilitates this consolidation of long term memories of memories that are you know uh, by the hippocampus. So, kind of interaction of hippocampus with the amygdala may create long term episodic memories, especially the emotional memories. So, amygdala activation might level specific memories as a strong emotional significance and trigger processes that enhance these memories for future reference. So, evidences at least shows uh, emotional memories, amygdala also plays a role in the um, facilitation of formation of uh, emotional memories with the help of hippocampus. There is a growing evidence to support this hypothesis as indicated by study of American sol soldiers who are wounded in combat. So, in one of the study, uh, it found that among those who experience brain damage, those combat uh, soldiers who experience brain damage outside the amygdala. So, brain, now whenever somebody is in a war situation, uh, there can be damage in any part of the brain or any area wherever no, uh, that attack has happened. 40 percent develop post traumatic stress disorder. So, wherever post traumatic stress disorder is a uh, disorder where no people after a traumatic event, very intense emotional experience, the person develop may develop a PTSD or post traumatic stress disorder, uh, where there are symptoms like you know re experiencing the person again and again re experiences those memories again and again. And there is also avoidance to this because these are very distressing, they do not want to face them, so they avoid them. And there is a lot of hyper arousal associated with those memories. Whenever you remember them, it you become very disturbed and so on. So, these are the symptoms of PTSD. Uh, a lot of the soldiers where the damage was not in the amygdala, any other part of the brain, 40 percent of them develop PTSD. So, PTSD was is, is a common thing generally soldier develops after a tra traumatic event like war, which has characteristics of vivid intrusive memories of those traumatic event uh, of war situation. In contrast, they found none of the soldiers with brain damage that involved amygdala developed this disorder. So, the soldiers whose brain was damaged and amygdala was damaged in those, those region where amygdala was there, they none of them develop PTSD. Now, to develop a PTSD, you need to experience those fear again and again, that is the main symptoms. Now, if amygdala is not there, this fearful emotional processing will not be there. So, they did not develop PTSD because the processing of emotions or formation of memories of emotions and fear is not possible without, uh, you know, without this amygdala. At least, you know, it, is, it plays very important role in those kind of formation of memories. So, when these memories will not be formed because amygdala has been damaged, so there is no question of developing PTSD. So, this also indirectly shows evidence of role of amygdala in formation of emotional memories. So, just a final thought on amygdala is that, you know, lot of these evidences are there, no doubt amygdala plays very important role in the uh, formation of memories as and emotions and particularly the fear emotions. Now, making conclusion from lot of these studies is not so easy because a lot of complexities are there. As we have seen the brain is an integrated organ, lot of functions are done like you know every part brain totally you know does integrated way you know lot of these functions. So, separating function of one organ exclusively is very difficult you know you cannot because because 
most of the functions are done by every aspects of the brain. So, separating one part is very difficult. So, identifying the psychological process that are influenced by specific brain structure is a very complex and time consuming process. At least this lot of this evidence shows. While researcher may observe increased activation of a structure during a particular task like amygdala we have seen for fear related things or a decrease in performance when it is absent as we have seen. Now, each of these tasks may include multiple aspects, multiple areas of the brain also, multiple psychological processes. Researchers only make educated guess about such processes associated with a particular structure and one need to rule out lot of these possibilities which takes time and uh, mostly the dominant functionalities only comes out. Exclusive functionality always there is uh, the functions a uh, lot of you know it is not so easy to separate out. So, there are a lot of practical constraints and uh, making conclusion from lot of this kind of studies is not so easy and it is very time consuming, but at least it indicates uh, the dominant functionalities of certain structure because of some multiple evidences. So, lastly we will be talking about uh, neurotransmitters uh, are these are basically chemical messengers which are released in the blood as well as between the neurons that carry messages between neurons one neuron to another. So, when a chemical messenger is put, so it conveys message from one neuron to another neuron. This is how the messages are conveyed uh, in the nerve cells and target cells all over the body, which could include glands, muscles, neurons and so on. So, these are neurotransmitters, they play a very important role. All the functions are done by functions of the body are, uh, is basically contributed by neurotransmitters. These molecules are continually at work in our brains coordinating everything from breathing to heart beat to learning and concentration level everything is controlled by lot of these neuros, neurotransmitters. They can also influence our psychological functions like fear, mood, pleasures and joy. So, emotions are also influenced by neurotransmitters. So, we will see only those neurotransmitters where the emotions are associated with them. Some common neurotransmitter in the brain are like serotonin, dopamine epinephrine, norepinephrine, endorphins and so on. So, we will see uh, dopamine uh, we have discussed a little bit in the last lecture, but uh, little bit more we will be discussing here. So, it is a neurotransmitter that plays major role in both pleasures and problems. So, it is a kind of um, in the last lecture we said these are like ho happy hormone, happy hormones or neurotransmitters which plays role in your experience of pleasures and happiness and uh, mood particularly enhancing mood and other things. So, it is produced in this part uh, called ventral ventral tegmental area. So, this is in the mid brain and helps different parts of the reward system communicate with each other. So, it is kind of associated with reward system. So, it kinds of give you a pleasant experiences uh, whenever there is a reward and those kind of positive thing neurotransmitter uh, this dopamine plays very important role making it essential for feeling of anticipation and reward. So, positive experience a positive mood is associated with dopamine. So, this is a positive thing dopamine motivates also goal oriented behavior reward system and other things. Many recreational drugs basically changes this dopamine reward system no? they increases this dopamine level such as cocaine, uh, it prolongs the effect of dopamine in the synapse. So, between the two neurons when dopamine is released, so they will prolong those dopamine release. So, the more dopamine will be released, they will experience more positive mood and uh, you know pleasures and so on associated with those drugs. So, this is kind of chemically inducing dopamine in the system. So, this it prolongs the effect of dopamine that is why they become more addictive and more pleasurable. So, people find it difficult to then not to take them. So, even caffeine can increase dopamine release. So, you feel good when we take caffeine. Alcohol can also increase dopamine activity in the reward circuit through ex the exact mechanism is still not clear. So, a lot of these things where we get a lot of pleasures out of it dopamine uh, a lot of this system dopamine release could be one of the factor. Certain drugs become addictive because of the effect of uh, dopamine reward system. So, studies have found that individuals addicted to drugs like you know cocaine, amphetamine, amphetamines and even alcohol also uh, 
these people actually uh, generally you know as they take more of these drugs they also have fewer dopamine receptors in the reward circle. So, if they have fewer dopamine receptor circles this also reduce the ability to experience pleasure from other things they need more intense and more kind of this kind of things to experience pleasure out of them. So, as people take drugs and other things they need more and more dose of it because of the reduced ability to experience pleasure from the same quantity as because they have fewer dopamine receptors. So, they need more and more and more and more intense those kind of thing and they lose the ability to get pleasure out of other things in the life. So, that is why addiction can become much more possible one of the reasons or mechanism is this dopamine activity. So, addiction to certain behaviors like even gambling, shopping, playing video games, sex and many may share some of the same neural mechanism as addiction to drugs as this activity the, these are also like addiction to drugs lot of these activities can become addictive as these activities can activate dopamine reward circuits. So, they activate these dopamine ex actions and they almost like you know does the addictive activity you know people become much more addicted to them because of the pleasure associated with dopamine activation. So, research has shown that treatments for Parkinson disease also sometimes increases uh, dopamine levels. Uh, then one of the side effect could be people become addicted to gambling, gambling problems and so on. So, dopamine activity increases, so they also become addicted to some other things like gambling and so on. This could be because of changes in the dopamine activity in the reward circuit. Serotonin is again another neurotransmitter uh, is also involved in the variety of psychological processes including memory, appetite control, sleep. Uh, but exact role in emotional experience is not yet clear, but there are lot of indications. Research has shown that serotonin also plays significant role in mood as it is also uh, uh, evident in the dopamine. Especially this is also used in the treatment of depression where anti uh, depression medications called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. A uh, lot of anti depression medication actually you know uses serotonin or increases tries to increase the level of serotonin uh, and keep the serotonin in the synapse for a longer period of time thereby increasing uh, stimulation of serotonin receptors. So, treat to change the mood from you know depression to let us say make them normal and so on. The relationship between serotonin and depression is very complicated and lot of things are still not clear uh, this a uh, lot of this medication that tries to enhance or increase the level of serotonin in the synapse do not start improving mode initially, but after a week generally initially the within the first week they generally do not have much impact. Uh, after that the mood generally becomes better. So, this the test of this hypothesis that depression is caused by inadequate serotonin levels has produced inconsistent findings. So, it is not a very consistent findings did not support this particular hypothesis. So, low levels of serotonin have been linked to aggressive behavior as well. Uh, as demonstrated in the laboratory research in rats, mice and monkeys. So, serotonin can be also linked to aggression apart from this mood. Human studies have also found that people with low serotonin levels are more likely to commit violent crimes including arson and repeat offenses after being released from the prison. So, uh, low serotonin could also kind of stimulate aggression and violence and so on. So, children and adolescents with low serotonin level in the are also more likely to re-engage in violent behaviors. So, a lot of indicates uh, research indicates that serotonin is also linked to violence and aggression. Additionally, people who survive violent suicide attempts with low serotonin level are more likely to attempt suicide again. So, if suicidal people have low serotonin level they are more likely to repeat those kind of suicide attempt again and again. So, this may be linked to low serotonin level. A review of available human literature found that relationship between decreased serotonin and increased violent behavior was consistent although moderate size. So, a lot of study shows this relationship, but the relationship may be of moderate size not a very strong correlation. So, but at least it indicates that it can play very important role in this particular behaviors. The last one is called beta endorphins is also another uh, neurotransmitter that plays very important role in the positive mood and uh, kind of pleasures. So, this is called uh, these are mostly uh, 
opioid peptides kind of uh, neurotransmitters uh, is also very important for uh, regulating emotions. Uh, one of the one well known example of beta endorphins a neurotransmitter that functions body's natural pain. So, beta endorphin is more like a natural pain killer like morphines given for pain killing. So, it is like naturally produced morphines in the body uh, which helps us to so, so, a lot of pain and uh, uh, physical and emotional pain if can be kind of reduced by release of endorphins. So, in that sense it is very important for connection with the emotions. So, this uh, endorphin is a blend of word endogenous morphine. It basically means endogenous morphine uh, since it operates similarly to morphine that is self produced. So, it is like self produced morphine which helps you to release or remove pain. Although not all physical traumas result in endorphin release, uh, endorphin activity in the brain stem can reduce pain in responsible of physical traumas and so on. So, pain release may it helps. Several studies have uh, connected alterations in beta endorphins activity with both physical and emotional pain. So, both physical and emotional pains could be associated with low endorphins level and uh, humans uh, both humans and laboratory animals also experience reduced endorphin release during times of social grief and loss. So, whenever emotional play, pain or grief sadness we experience generally the there is a decrease in the release of endorphins. So, with the increase of endorphin release your mood gets better. In fact, lot of some research also shows that when we do exercise or physical exercise endorphins are released and it helps you to enhance your mood. So, after exercise generally people feel good mood. Uh, one of the reason is release of these endorphins. So, in one study baby uh, guinea pig wept when separated from mothers indicating distress and low endorphin release. So, whenever this uh, uh, pigs kind of separated from the mothers uh, and they experience distress, endorphins release was very low. However, they ceased crying when given a mild dose of morphine to replace the decreased endorphins. When externally morphine was given uh, to replace those decreased endorphins, they stopped crying. So, it immediately had an impact on the mood. Conversely, when given a naloxone, a medication that blocks endorphins activity, they cried even harder. So, when endorphin was further blocked, they started crying harder. So, it also shows emotional pain and uh, sadness is also associated with low level of endorphins. Another study asked young women to describe life events including sad and neutral ones. This PET scan which positron, <coughs> positron emission tomography uh, is a scanning technique. It revealed the decreased endorphins release in various brain regions when the woman recounted sad events, but not other type of events. So, again sad events when they uh, kind of uh, discussed about sad events. Uh, this PET scan showed decreased endorphins release in the brain. So, this also shows you know, uh, its association with mood and emotions. So, it is endorphins mediates both physical and emotional pain. In both physical pain as well as emotional pain is associated with probably you know low endorphins level and with the in release of higher endorphins level mood becomes much better. So, these are some of the findings related to uh, neurotransmitters which are associated with emotions. So, it is very clear from this module that emotions are associated with a lot of physiological changes in the body as well as brain and uh, all these uh, changes are associated with different emotions and uh, emotions we cannot talk about emotions without really looking at the physiological changes that are associated with emotions. So, physiology is very understanding physiological changes is very important in order to understand the impact of emotions. So, this module I think we have tried to touch upon some of the important aspects of it and uh, this understanding will help us to understand emotions in a better way. With this I stop here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.